Okay, um, so on to the first talk. It's um, my it's my very great um, privilege to welcome Nat Titman. We're very honoured to have um, them talking. Um, Nat is notable for a number of reasons. Um, one being the, um, the founder of the Asexuality Live Journal community um, back in 2002. This, in fact, even preceded the AVEN, Asexuality Vis Asexual Visibility and Education Network, by um, well, it, it preceded the AVEN forums by um, a couple of months. Um, and that's also known for, right, for being heavily involved in writing the, FAQ, the first FAQ on AVEN as well. Um, and Nat is more recently known for running the site practical and um, So it's my very great privilege to. <laughs> yeah. You should probably put on doing this. Okay. But anyway, I'd like to um, welcome that and um, I look forward to the first talk. Thank you. I wasn't very happy about that. I didn't have a very positive outlook. 
and I had quite poor self-esteem. Um, but that changed at age 16, um, because I realised that while I didn't have sexual attraction, I, I was having romantic feelings for some people, and those romantic feelings were what society called queer. And identifying as queer made this huge difference to me, because this was a community uh, which was all about being different, being kind of off from the mainstream, but celebrating that as a positive thing, finding pride in your differences, which was at that point just the type of perspective I needed on life. Uh, when I was 17, I finally got access to the internet, uh, which was quite early, it was the 90s. Um, and I quickly found through uh, pre-Google search engines things like queer, transgender, and even some early genderqueer communities. But again, I struggled to find anything about people who didn't experience sexual attraction like me. Any attempt to kind of research this through out of Vista site or dog pile or any of those other <laughs> Yahoo directory <laughs> tended to come up with stuff about impotence, sexual dysfunction and celibacy, which is people intentionally choosing not to have sex. Uh, very little though about people who were able <coughs> to enjoy sexual stimulation but just didn't have the drive to share that with other people. Um, one of the reasons why there was so little out there was, and why that, what there was was so difficult to find was because asexuality wasn't really a defined thing. Unlike today, you didn't stumble across asexuals on every social website you visited. You certainly didn't hear about the orientation from your local LGBT group or your school sex education lessons, unless you were being talked about amoebas. <laughs> Everyone who was talking about being asexual back then had kind of essentially invented the concept of human asexuality. You'd have to have stumbled across this word, probably in your biology classes or some other context, and you'd have to have identified with this so strongly that you thought to apply this to yourself and then not being put off when you entered this into a search engine and found absolutely nothing relevant. <laughs> I probably first heard about asexuality applied to a person through being involved with Doctor Who fandom online. Uh, in, in 97, the TV movie had just happened and debates were still rife in the Doctor Who community over whether the Doctor kissing Grace Holloway was acceptable, <laughs> given that they've been the first three years of the Doctor's history and it's never been shown before. So, reading Reckhart's Doctor Who, I would come across people saying, my Doctor is asexual, all of the time. So this, this, was, this was probably where I first heard that. Uh, of course, most of those fans were talking about our kind of asexuality. If you look on a Doctor Who forum now, people are talking about the Doctor's romantic orientation. And what people were saying then was that he was an alien, and so he wasn't interested in these frivolous human things. In fact, the Doctor Who novels of that era explained how the Doctor's race reproduced without having sex. They were, they were weaved in looms. They didn't have the equipment. <laughs> so they didn't really mean our type of asexual then. That's no longer canon, I understand. Um, I'd also come across asexual being used to describe people in, in queer and genderqueer writing, uh, of which I've read a lot of by that point. Um, discussions of media portrayals of the type of gender nonconformity associated with queer communities tended to say how the, me the, the media portrayals would kind of desexualize people. They would kind of take communities that were, you know, Things like drag queens, which are in the wild, but drag, drag queens tend to be quite sexual and be, it's all about satirizing sexual mores and, and, and for gender reasons as well, it, it varies. But in media portrayals, in 2 one Food, for example, it's just, they're just really lovely, cuddly people who come along to help the straight people have a good time. <laughs> and uh, I, most, I most fondly remember this discussion of kind of desexualized androgynous people and drag queens associated with Boy George's 1980s public persona. He, he claims to prefer a cup of tea to having sex, which, you know, I can see that. But behind the scenes, we now know he was living a very different life. And uh, again, this was the word asexual often came up in this. They, they were talking about people, people being asexualized by the media. Um, another notable androgynous person who was often associated with the word, and again had appeared in the media, uh, was, um, was a person called Toby, who in 1989 appeared on an American talk show called Sally Jesse Raphael. Um, Toby talked about being androgynous, non-sexual, and having an externally sexless body. 
um, this appearance had made such an impact on audiences that people were still mixing up all of those concepts ten years later, to the point when, as an androgynous genderqueer person in the late 90s, people were often saying, oh, that's like Toby, so you're asexual as well, or you're this, that, and the other. And it was, it was something that androgynous people were constantly fighting against, is if you're androgynous, you must be asexual or non-sexual, or whatever the word people were using. Um, and looking through the, my email archive in, in um, preparation for this talk, because um, I have a huge amount of webmaster at Avon dot, uh, webmaster, webmaster at asexuality dot org emails from 2002, there's somebody um, asking about whether we, whether we could help them track down Toby, because they'd seen this and it had stuck with them, and they'd Googled for asexual, thinking that's what Toby was, and found Avon. Um, it wasn't, wasn't actually that surprising. I don't believe really Toby ever referred to them, their self or this as himself as asexual. They called themselves neuter. Um, but the literature, there's a number of books that talked about Toby and said this is an asexual person. There's even a case study in a book called Sexuality Now, Embracing Diversity. Oh, I want to do the thingy. I'll just scroll past. <laughs> I, I should have remembered. I never did this in my practice. <laughs> this is this is the book. Um, this is the book. Sexuality Now: Embracing Diversity, published. I think this is the 2007 edition. Yes, it is. Because in the corner now it says asexuality. Top left corner it says asexuality often refers to the lack of sexual desire which the previous edition did not say. So this is talking about the concept of asexualism being a gender category, literally meaning lack of maleness or femaleness. And thankfully, due to Avon's work, and I'm pretty sure it is because of Avon, because in the third edition that came a year after this, it's full of references to Avon. It, even, it, it, it has like a case study that's just about Avon. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this isn't in the book anymore, I assume, because they decided it was confusing. So this is, this is an example of of, of, of uh, an academic using the word asexual to mean something we wouldn't identify at all, talking about asexual as a kind of like transsexual rather than or in, intersex. It's it's not. You know, obviously, I, obviously, Toby wasn't wasn't is an intersex person, but that's never mentioned in any of the literature. It's always asexual, neuter, never never comes up. So, in the 1990s, if you were looking around and trying to find some description of an asexual person, you wouldn't be really talking about a lack of sexual attraction so much as somebody who is completely kind of neuter or, or completely, not only has no romance, no sexuality, possibly no gender at all, it was kind of a literal neuter thing um, and often confused with androgyny. Um, Things began to change in 2000. I can't remember what my slides are. Oh. <laughs> this is, um, yeah. Um, things began to change in 2000, though, as people who had claimed the label asexual for themselves started to find each other and talk about their shared identity on the internet. And I'm inclined to pin this development on the rise of the superior Google search engine. The earliest article that I recall claiming, claiming and defining asexual in a way that I recognise as being our definition, was a, um, an article written in 2007 by Zoe O'Reilly called My Life is an Amoeba, um, which it's a really, really good article, and it's, it's talking about it in terms of coming out, related to Ellen coming out that year. And that is, you read that now, it's modern asexuality. It's, it's really, really good stuff. And it has a comment section that you might reasonably call the first asexual discussion community because it's just full of people who suddenly found this article going, other people are like me, and talking to it. It's got page-long comments that are people just giving their entire life story. 